Well, welcome everybody. Um, I'm really, really happy to be a part of such an amazing network of people. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, my name is Betsy Rosenchuk. I am the founder and executive director at Home Sweet Home, which is located in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, I'm going to keep letting people in here as they pop into the waiting room. Um, if we could maybe run through, again, be really, really brief. We have almost 40 people on here. Um, and so we're going to have to just be really concise um, when we're giving any feedback. A reminder that you can type um, additional thoughts and comments in the notes section. Um, and this recall is being recorded. And so um, those that are not able to join us today um, will be able to come in and kind of learn from whatever we're, we're all sharing. And when we forget what we said, we can go back and listen to it. Um, I'm gonna just call out names and um, do a simple, quick who you are and where you're from, um, organization and city, if that's helpful. Uh, Bobby Mosier. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Uh, my name is Bobby Mosier. I'm the operations manager for Furniture Friends, and we're located in the greater Portland, Maine area. Great. Kate? Oh, hi. Um, I'm Kate, and I'm with Fresh Start Furniture Bank. I'm the manager there. And um, we are in Hudson, Massachusetts. Mike Broderick. Hi, uh, yes, I'm with uh, Household Goods in Acton, Mass Massachusetts, and I'm just an active volunteer board member and IT chief IT guy there. So, uh, Robert. Robert Myers. Uh, I'm with Off the Floor Pittsburgh in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Perfect. Allison. Um, I'm guessing that's me, unless there's another one. Um, Allison Schoberg here. I run a furniture program um, through Journey Home in Hartford, Connecticut. We cover about 38 towns. Awesome. Um, where did my list go? Oh, I think I'm losing people. Okay, Bob, Jeff Schultz. Hi, uh, Jeff and Sue here. We are co-founders and volunteers of Fresh Start Furniture Bank in Hudson, and we are stuck out of the country during this and managing from Mexico. Oh my, that's an added challenge. Yep, it is. Uh, John Fallon? Uh, I'm from Household Goods in Acton also. I'm uh, very heavily involved in the donor side. Perfect. John Hinkle? Hi, I'm... Uh, John Hinkle, I'm from the Furniture Bank of Tallahassee. I'm the director. Great, nice to meet you. Kent Barker? Hi, I'm Kent. I'm the lead volunteer at the Furniture Bank at Salem Lions Church in Salem, Oregon. Okay, Lisa Crawford? Um, I'm the director of Humble Design Detroit Pontiac location. Um, we do design services and provide furniture for those transitioning out of homelessness. Perfect. Maggie? Hi, Maggie Furrow from Wings Advocacy Fresno in Fresno, California. Um, Ron Widerstein? Is there a Ron? Okay, we'll come back. Susan? Hi, I'm Susan Rizzoli from Open Door Exchange in Port Jefferson Station, New York. Vicki? Hi, I'm Vicki Stevenson with Homestar Foundation in Vancouver, BC, um, and I'm the executive director. Cool. Amanda Wolf? Amanda, you might be on mute. Okay, try again. Um, <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm Amanda. I'm the new volunteer coordinator for New Life Furniture Bank of Massachusetts in Walpole. Uh, Lisa Crawford? You did me already. Oh, okay, sorry. The names keep moving around all of a sudden. Hi. Megan? Uh, hey, I'm Megan Anderson. I'm director of the Furniture Bank in Atlanta. Um, let's see, Charles Faubert? Yep, Charles Faubert. I am with Faubert. Welcome Collective in Montreal, Quebec. Dan Shea, or Brian Shea, sorry. You're on mute, Brian. Uh, 
Okay. We'll come back to Brian. Uh, Janet? I'm Janet Runquist, Home Sweet Home, St. Louis. I'm the Administrative Coordinator. Uh, Dan? Uh, Dan Kershaw from Furniture Bank in Toronto, Executive Director. Jeremy? Uh, Jeremy Simler, um, director of um, the things that bring in the monies in Tacoma, Washington, Northwest Furniture Bank. Uh, Lisa Long? Yeah, I'm mute, babe. Sorry, um, I'm Lisa Long. I work with Betsy at Home Sweet Home in St. Louis. Okay, the names have all moved around. So who who to speak up if I, I missed you? I'm, 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 I'm Holland. I'm from Household Goods in Acton. And then, hello, I'm Andrew Witherspoon. I'm the co-founder and co-executive director of the Chicago Furniture Bank. I'm Sharon Martins, executive director of Household Goods in Acton. I'm Nancy Cannell, uh, founder of Project Home Again in Lawrence, Massachusetts. Uh, Matt Higgins, Director of Operations of the Northwest Furniture Bank in Tacoma. I'm Bill uh, Lemke, I'm, oh. Bill Lemke, Executive Director of Northwest Furniture Bank in Tacoma. Hi, Mary Vaught, uh, Controller at Northwest Furniture Bank in Tacoma. Tacoma, Washington. Lena Garland, I'm the Media Content Manager at the Blessing Board in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'm Jen McAdoo, the Executive Director of Furniture Friends in Portland, Maine. Hi, I'm Richard, I'm uh, the Executive Director of New Life in Walpole, Greater Boston. I'm Melissa Von Rohr, I'm with Betsy and I handle um, the nation logistics. Great, was there anyone else? Hi. Um, I am Liz Hitt, and I'm the Executive Director for the Homeless and Travelers Aid Society in Albany, New York. And hey, I'm uh, Bob, Bob, Bob. Hi, Bob. I come with Susan from the Open Door Exchange in Long Island, New York. Okay, go ahead, Bob. Hi, Bob and Emberg, uh, First Start Furniture Bank in Hudson, Mass, uh, a board member and a volunteer. I am Harry Swanson with the board in the Free Store in Des Moines, Iowa. Hi, I'm Sarah Tucci and I'm with the Homeless and Travelers Aid Society's Furniture Bank in Albany, New York as well. Great. All right. Did we get everybody? Uh, so Dan had a great suggestion of putting emails into the chat um, and we'll grab all of those later so that way we can follow up with people if we want to take any next steps. Um, another question and maybe Dan you can help with this, where would be a good spot to dump information as we're talking about it? Um, of course we can use the, the chat but um, later I know Lisa keeps sharing with me all kinds of great resources and graphics that um, we're finding other furniture banks doing with the best place to put those beyond the Facebook group or the Furniture Bank Network site? Uh, we, can, we can put them in both places. Um, if uh, we can put them on the Furniture Bank uh, Network site. So if you put the links in the chat or get them to me, we can get them posted on a common place we can all share. Okay. Um, and just, uh, let's see, um, I'm gonna share the agenda um, on a screen share, but, um, we can also keep this really fluid. So if something really comes up that we get into, I'm not gonna stop us. Um, however, I might make a note that maybe we can have a breakout session later. Um, so that way we can um, dig in if it looks like there's really a need to get some more information later. All right, can you all see the... Uh... Mm -hmm. Yes. Perfect. Um, 
So for those, uh, actually I'm gonna reorder this um, a little bit. For those who are still opened and for those who are still operating, um, would anyone like to share some of their experience or what they're doing? Yes. Andrew. Um, yep, from the Chicago Furniture Bank. So we are still quasi-operational. Um, that being said, we have shifted everything from in-person to virtual. Um, so working with our appointment scheduling system currently, we are only offering virtual appointments. That means video calls. Um, we have two um, customer-facing um, staff members who are conducting video calls via Zoom meeting, like we are right now, uh, FaceTime or Google Duo. So if they have a smartphone or they have a computer, we are able to. Um, we started this uh, March 30th. Since then, we've done over um, 70 appointments like this. We are offering 10 virtual appointments a day. Um, and with this, we have restrict, we are not doing any um, donation pickups in residential um, homes. Uh, we cannot, we are not allowing any of our staff members or driving teams to enter any homes. Um, for, for obvious reasons, everyone uh, has to wear masks. We have latex gloves under the work gloves, um, as well as practicing social distancing at our warehouse. Um, we are, you know, we're doing reduced personnel, minimum people um, as needed in the warehouse. Um, and then we're treating everything. So fortunately for us, the, the, the products that we treat uh, any beds from, so beds we get from hotel liquidations, couches and things like that, does kill COVID-19. It's a hassle. Oh, right I'm sorry, what was that, Andrew? Um, Sterifab, so we use Sterifab oh, on, yeah, so our district, as soon as, you know, the COVID-19 outbreak um, was accepted in the United States, uh, you know, our distributor made sure we were aware it's, it kills COVID-19. So any, any, anything that comes into the dock is immediately sprayed with it uh, and aired out and brought in and then also on the way out as well. So it's kind and of- And you're, you're delivering inside the home or you drop it outside yeah. the home? So currently right now, we are only offering self-haul appointments. So there's usually we do offer in-home installation to bring it in. We have suspended that. Um, we are doing curbside delivery contact, contactless. So we will unload everything in the front. They must maintain at least six feet away uh, while we are unloading. And then, and then they take it in. Um, so we're doing that as well as self hauls. So if they're able to come to the U-Haul, uh, they cannot leave the, the cabin of the truck. Uh, or if they do, they have to be at least six feet away from our dock until it's complete. At that point, our team will roll back up, we'll close down the dock, then they can pull out partially and they can check everything is there. Um, during this time, communication, they can call us at the front office uh, and via radios and things like that to, to communicate. And how are you keeping up with inventory, Andrew? Um, so with inventory, it's, it's pretty hard without the, uh, those, the donation pickups. Um, we have just been reaching out, reaching out, reaching out to our partners in that li both liquidators and hotels. So we're seeing as a number of hotels are at least trying to, certainly no one's in them, they're trying to move up their furniture replacement. So we have to get um, a couple um, more and more shipments through hotel liquidations. Uh, but we're continuing just to reach out. And then also, so our residential pickups, we have suspended, uh, but we still are doing, we have a junk removal arm. So for people who are, who are closing on houses, um, have been, it's a vacant apartment or storage unit. We are continuing to do that um, as well as, uh, yeah, vacant, vacant apartments and things like that. So we are, we are relying on uh, bulk hotel liquidations at this, at this time, especially for kitchen tables, dressers, 
and shares. If you have any questions as folks are talking, throw them into the chat and I can uh, help facilitate that if there's something that pops into your mind. Um, Andrew, are you guys treating the trucks too um, as you go back and forth? Um, we have Lysol and, and wipes in the trucks. Okay. We're any other questions? Yeah, we are trying to get more and more Lysol. I mean, uh, I know, so we work very closely with the, the Philadelphia Furniture Bank, uh, Tom Maroon up there kind of act as our mentor. And I know that they are doing, you know, curbside and pickups if they're brought out of the home. And they are making sure everyone spraying everything down with Lysol before and after. Does anyone have any questions for Andrew? I saw, I saw someone, uh, Lisa, uh, Ms. Crawford, where do we get Sterifab from? We get Sterifab from a local Chicago bug, I guess, exterminator. Uh, it's, we get it for uh, $30 a gallon. Um, so it's $120 a case. Thank you. That was really could you, helpful. Could you walk us through the, the virtual shopping? Uh -huh. uh, where, where, where are they? Are they outside your building? Uh, uh, how long does it last? Mm -hmm. so, so how we do it is, so it's a video call. So let's say we have, it's at 9.30 a.m. We will call them. Because they're not physically in our space, we are not requiring the caseworker to be there. We don't have that liability. Um, so it's usually just with 95%, it's just the client. We walk through how many people they have, confirm delivery dress or confirm that they have a truck and are able to pick up same day. Uh, it's either or. And then um, I, my team member, they just walk around well, when they convert to a video call, we walk around our showroom. So they're able to see all the couches. They can see the chairs, dressers, kitchen tables, et cetera, and just walk through. Um, on average, it takes between about 30 to 40 minutes um, for items, because we also do collect and disperse uh, other household goods. So kitchenware, um, you know, rugs, picture frames, et cetera. We will ask them, based on the size of the family, we will, get, we will pick out the kitchenware. Because as you can imagine, that would surely take for a, a very long time to go through all the glasses. So we will assemble um, kitchenware pots and pans um, for rugs and things like that. Uh, we go over with them. It is going. It goes to match the couch. So whatever couch color they pick, that c dictates what rugs they get. Um, and then certain items, a desk, for instance, they do not pick out the desks. They, uh, if they want a desk, we will give them a, a desk and a computer chair. Um, and yeah, that's. I think there's a couple other items for for beds, for instance. Um, I don't know what your guys' policy is, but we get beds through hotel liquidation. So we have a sea of beds on our third floor. Um, those are always just given out. They're inspected at least six times. They're sprayed with Sterifab, and then they're given out. It's just based on what size, queen, full, or twin. Um, and so that's basically it. So, okay. yeah. Andrew, uh, quick question on uh, Matt, uh, Northwest Furniture Bank. Um, are you finding clients uh, able to access the virtual uh, appointments easily? Mm -hmm. um, yes. So there's, there have only been uh, that I have been aware. So since we started, I guess, March 30th, few individuals who have not been able to, um, because obviously you, you do need a, a smartphone, Android, or uh, iPhone uh, or computer. With those instances, uh, the caseworker or agency representative um, has, vol has voluntarily, with permission from the individual, to pick out pick out the stuff. Uh, what we're hoping to and and to get to is if we can get continue to get hotel liquidations, we would be able to photograph um, photograph like the options, kind of make a, a hotel set. And then they would be able to, the caseworkers would be able to see this, um, send it to them, 
it'd be easier for them to see it. So if they don't have, you know, a video call thing, they can still see the photos. Thank you. But we, yeah, but I'm seeing, cause we, we do send out, so with our virtual appointment um, logging, they do have to say, do you have a smartphone or a device that can do Zoom, Android, Google, Android, no, Google Duo, which is for Android or FaceTime iPhone. So they, they fill that out. And if there are some issues, usually um, then a caseworker works. Um, yeah. And then with that, because, you know, even with Zoom, any video calling, um, you know, the quality can be questionable. Um, when we first launched it, we did get some issues where people were returning items. Hey, I didn't see that scratch. Hey, I didn't see this. Um, so we are offering to send, you know, photo uh, messages after um, just to, to verify, you know, what they picked up. Great, thank you. Any other questions for Andrew? I just have a quick question for Andrew. Um, this is Bobby from Portland, Maine. Um, so Andrew, when it comes to your liquidators and it comes to like the hotels, are you going to pick up from them or are they delivering to you? Um, we have, for the most part, currently right now, they, they are dropping off. Um, so our, our last, you know, liquidation was the, co co I think it's college guys who, who hold junk. Um, they, they got a contract to, to liquidate and then install the furniture. So they were just running their trucks to and from our warehouse. Um, so that is primarily there. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for getting us started with that, Andrew. Um, Dan, I know you guys have been doing, um, changing up your operations in Toronto. You want to explain a little bit about what that looks like? Yeah, we paused operations on the March 17th. Um, we took a page from Bay Area uh, Furniture Bank and uh, traditionally we were seeing 20 families a day. Um, so we skipped the virtual uh, showing because when we ran the numbers, we would never be able to sustain it. So we're, uh, agencies are making a more or less online furniture requests uh, and we're fulfilling those kits and then ultimately delivering them. Um, all our furniture social enterprise, which does pickups, we're up, up and operational. Um, but the whole process end to end is all distanced. So donors are doing curbside uh, or garage uh, drops at their place. Our staff are coming in. Uh, furniture, when it gets back to Furniture Bank, is being isolated for three days before it moves into rotation. Uh, and the furniture that's available is then uh, used as the basis to draw down to send out uh, fresh start kits. Dinechka, thank you for the idea. Um, uh, so we're now in Toronto. Uh, we're part of the uh, Rapid Housing uh, Initiative. So we're, I think this week we're sending out 80 fresh start kits, which include everything uh, to turn an empty space. So we're Effectively now virtual, the warehouse, for those who've been, used to be a showroom and then warehouse. It's now all warehouse and uh, staff are able to essentially assemble uh, furniture kits uh, at around 20 a day when everything's going well. And do you have any volunteers in at all right now? No, unfortunately, in our case, most of our volunteers are 65, 70, 80, so they've all self-selected out for good reasons um, so we're we're cautiously looking at how to bring it back but we're we're sort of we're planning with the long term in mind we don't see this isn't going to go away so we've sort of our operating posture is this is the new reality um, if good things come back that's great but uh, we have we're sort of designing it with this distanced uh, and virtual model um, being the go forward Dan, have you had any pushback of delivering a, a green sofa to somebody that really would have preferred a brown sofa? So far, no. Um, uh, yeah, it's, and I think that's, we've got the measurement mechanisms, mechanisms in place uh, that we're going to track it. 
Um, I know Bay Area has had a lot of success doing this model, so we will tinker with it, but so far, no pushback. And how did you decide on the three days for the furniture? Oh, uh, we're the, we've got a little COVID uh, war room and we've been, there's only three academic studies on the planet around how long COVID lasts on surfaces. And when you get to uh, metal glass and I'll share the links uh, in chat, um, three days is, you know, you can let nature take care of itself. The virus won't last after three days. Thanks. And I know you said that um, you're tracking data on how people have responded to the green versus brown sofa debate, but pending that data, how do you think you're going to move forward after coronavirus? Do you like the idea of the kits or are you more um, into the idea of a furniture showroom? Because obviously it's to both. Yeah, I think we're, we're leaning more towards that virtualization uh, model. We've spent the last two years in, in my community, I've got 45,000 families uh, worth of capacity that notionally we should build up to. Um, and when we look at, our, you know, setting aside uh, the space, we could probably support double the families by going this route. So some of the silver lining and some of the things that we were maybe going to do over the next year, we did in three weeks. Um, so, and there are some of our agencies, uh, the city of Toronto is happy to pay us $900 a family. And, and for that, we are happy to give them a showroom. Um, so our, but there are other agencies that don't have any funds. So we'll probably end up having a two tier. There'll be the basic fresh start kit, which is, you know, curated uh, furniture solutions uh, and home goods solutions into the home. And then we'll have a, a more premium option. I think that's where we'll, we'll net out in the end. And then just to, just to build Andrew again from Chicago Furniture Bank, we are also looking at expanding our, the online, I guess, as you would say, um, furniture kits. So we're looking at being able to build a website platform where if there were bulk donations of, of items, so if you have, you know, hundred of one, uh, dresser, couches, and, and whatnot, you would be able to make an online catalog that would, you know, partner organizations would log in to select the number of kits, what is in each kit, and then we would be able to expedite delivery. That's something that, that we're working on. We're applying a couple grants to build out um, th this idea, and hopefully we'll, we will have that going in a, in a couple months from the Chicago Furniture Bank. Dan, yep. what are you doing um, to protect your staff? What sort of um, measures are you taking with like, your crew that's out on the road? Yeah, so the, we've our, we've got our pickup business, uh, and so everything, we've broken it down so that there, were, there is no physical interaction with donors. Uh, while we ask donors on the phone when they're making the, the booking, uh, that we've got the standard questions around out of the country, anybody sick, et cetera. We're still assuming uh, that they got infected that day. So the staff have all the PPE, uh, the gloves, the masks, and all of those things. And then we're bringing it in uh, to segregated sort of islands of furniture from the donations for the day. Uh, so the combination of the equipment and time uh, is allowing us to ensure that every step of the way we've got some safety. And most of the, for the clients, it's being, um, currently it's all being delivered into empty housing right now. Dan, I wanted to clarify, did I hear you say that the city of Toronto pays you $900 per house? Yep, per home, yep. Okay, and uh, how do you address, um, the idiosyncrasies of low-income housing uh, and the challenges of delivering furniture to them. Yeah, right. Normally, we're uh, a the furniture is being selected. We know it's not going to go up fire escapes, uh, you know, or tight corners. So a lot of the product that's being selected is we know traditionally will make it up there. Um, 
the so some of the donations we're receiving or we're not able to use uh, some of them will go into the workshop and the repair shop for to be upcycled um, but we we work very closely with the agencies they've been able to help uh, shape and identify what's what's of uh, priority uh, but that's constantly tinkering we're also fortunate um, uh, we've been developing a, a relationship with IKEA and IKEA has just committed uh, to furniture banks in Canada. Sorry, I tried down the States too, um, but are donating uh, a large amount of in-kind goods. So a lot of it will be able to supplement uh, from our regular donation stream. So families are getting pretty robust cuts. Can we back up just one minute? You talked about these kits that you're putting out there and if they're able to shop, like it's no, because... It's it's not. It's not a. It, not like uh, many are looking at is the the use of video and individually selecting. It's going to be. I need two sofas, a dining room chair. I have no pots. Uh, so it, it's. It's a. So they're getting whatever you put together. Yeah. Because um, somebody said something about cataloging. Um, so there's no. And that would take a, an enormous amount of time yeah, to maintain. The, historically, we were turning our inventory every forty eight hours. So the I'm a nerdy person and the act of putting up a photo and taking down a photo and doing that a hundred times a day is just, we just haven't found a, a technology solution that you could do it at scale and that's our challenge is uh, if, if you can sustain doing one or two videos a day or a, at a time uh, that'll work really well uh, our challenge is, uh, is at scale that we're operating in our market and you know we all have bills to pay um, so if we shrink our capacity, I'm laying off staff. I've got 44 staff. I am trying very hard to uh, hold on to. Thank you. And how do you do with, deal with taste? Like it, I guess the, the, the clients are removed from, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm playing the long game. I want to be there so that a year from now or six months from now, I can have that conversation about taste. We want to find a way to get back to it, but you know, I, I'm one of the naysayers. I really worry about this sector that um, I don't know if we'll get a chance to talk about fundraising, but up in Canada, if you're not a food or a healthcare charity, you are S O L. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we're fortunate. We have a social enterprise where we generate 60% of our funding from trucking. Um, I really worry about how do we all keep our staff and keep our buildings uh, if all the fundraising dollars are heading to other charities in the space. Yeah. A great point, Dan. So I put that on like a perhaps a future conversation that yeah, we have. I think, we, I think that's important. I know Jeremy's got answers. He always does. Any other questions for Dan? I popped in the uh, the cleaning and disinfectant, and I'm also going to pop in the how we explain the distance process, which is end to end, which might help. Thank you. I have a question. Dan, are you, how many people do you have in your trucks? Because one of the things we've been talking about is if you have two people in your cab, then you don't have the social distancing. How are you dealing with that? Uh, right now, we're just, it's two per. Um, we've got a, the, we had a paramedic, um, a friend of mine. He was the first SARS victim in Canada. Um, and so he came in and actually helped us uh, really treat our trucks as though they were the uh, surgical ward. So as he highlighted, if you keep your trucks pristine, then when they leave the truck, they're leaving their safety environment. So it, it's, you know, on the, in the working uh, of the day, uh, they're safe. Uh, as they move around the world, uh, that's the only risk factor. So far, knock on wood, uh, everybody's following the procedures and we're not, we haven't had any uh, COVID cases at this point. Did you do an official training um, or with them, or how did you how did you prep them? Because I know our team, especially at movers, are not as rule followers as yes, some of the it rest. Certainly of us. was every day reinforced. Um, I have teenagers; they are kind of like teenagers. You got to tell them seven times, seven different ways, and even then, you got to try it eight, nine. Um, some took it the first time, and others are still a challenge. But generally, the teams. When a team gets it, they follow it and they live to it. But it is, we have to keep reminding them. 
someone get excited and they want to like high five their friends and we got to undo some habits. If, if anyone has any official like training documents that they've used, um, feel free to drop them in the thing or we can find a way to share them because I'd be really, that's something our board is going to have a conversation about. Any other thoughts for Dan? Anyone else want to share what you've been doing or what you're thinking about doing as you start to reopen? I can tell you from our experience, New Life, uh, we opened up with an online store where we're actually putting each uh, item on. Uh, but our model has never been one where we serve huge numbers of clients. We were kind of a niche within furniture banks. Um, it's, it's going pretty well. It's not actually that uh, laborsome to, to put the items on. Uh, one thing that may change is we got a massive donation from Wayfair on Friday. So we have a lot of like items. So we can, instead of putting um, like individual couches up, we're going to be putting up, I don't know, hopefully 10, 20 items that will look the same. So it's one item. Uh, we're just getting into it. So we've served three clients in this method, but you still need a lot of hand holding. So uh, we have two client hosts that call in with the client um, to walk them through the online store. Uh, and we, because again, it, it comes back to technology. Not everybody has access to, to Zoom or internet good enough to video conference. So with the online store method or the website, they're able to see the website and also make a call into the conference number. I mean, it's going pretty well and it's something we're looking to expand upon. Uh, but we're kind of only working with um, one agency at the moment. Uh, that's the VA uh, specifically. That's about it. I mean, I think it's a lot of uh, the same of what Dan and uh, Chicago is doing. And you're also delivering? We don't deliver. What we do is though there's a, a program in Massachusetts that pays for delivery. So we're working with one moving company that comes in. So we serve clients on typically on a Wednesday and on a Friday they'll come to our warehouse and pick up. And so there's no human involvement and they use their own COVID-19 precautions. What's been your biggest challenge then? Uh, demand. We're actually, I, I get calls every day now of people wanting to, uh, uh, to be served by the furniture bank. I don't think that, uh, I, and it's also, another one is that we don't serve people who self move uh, because we don't feel that we're at a level of safety yet to allow uh, volunteers to help load trucks or, um, and yet they're the ones that struggle the most because if you are below the poverty line, you get a lot of supports. If you're just a little above the, the, the arbitrary income threshold, then you don't get any and then, but they're the ones that really need it most. So we're having to turn them away and say, look, we're not going to be able to serve you for, for another four weeks at least um, so that they can find other alternatives. But if you're below, you get, there's a program they can enter into and they get paid uh, movers. Great, thanks Rich. What other, any other questions for Rich? Yeah, I just wanted to ask Rich, what is that program that pays for the moving support? Yeah. REFT, R-A-F-T. And is that a um, state of Massachusetts program or is it a federal program? I, I think it may be limited to Boston, in fact. Um, I'm looking over the website now uh, because of something Dan said uh, about working with rapid rehousing. We work a lot in Boston and they have uh, programs by other names. Um, but it seems like it's, it's operated by Metro Housing Boston. Um, I always thought it was a Massachusetts program, but again, 
it's something uh, home base is another okay. name that is, is associated with the ref program anyone have anything else for rich hi uh, uh not for rich sorry no go ahead go ahead Rob. Um, my name is Rob Petrosino. Um, I was invited to the call by Bill um, over at Northwest Furniture. Um, I'm actually working um, in a technology company. We're called Peak Activity. Uh, we launched a program to basically address all the concerns that everyone's having on this call. We currently work with several major furniture retailers across um, Florida and California. Um, we work with more furniture out west uh, in all their locations as well as uh, city furniture down here. Um, we launched a program to do virtual appointments and as well as doing some road mapping for future digitally focused engagements when it comes to furniture and selling and purchasing alike. Um, I spoke to Bill uh, about it. He invited me to call to kind of chat about it a little bit. but everything from booking appointments online to doing live chat integrations to websites to getting e-commerce like systems up and running. Um, so happy to kind of be a voice of guidance or take on questions or give any information that I can about the program. Um, myself, Bill and Matt had about a 45 minute call to just talk about some of the practices that retailers are putting in place. Um, so happy to kind of share that knowledge if anyone's interested or I'll drop my email in the chat too, if anyone yeah, wants to. Yeah, if you out. could drop your email and um, maybe a website or some more information down in the the chat, that would be great. Um, I think we could take like one or two thoughts or questions uh, for Rob, um, if someone's interested. Um, Sorry, but did somebody? Okay. Um, Megan, are you still on here? Yeah, you are. Um, so I know I've watched a little bit of uh, the state of Georgia struggle with um, state yeah. versus local officials. I'm How are you all? Yeah. <laughs> How are you all handling that, and what is your plan? So, um, so what we did in the very beginning is we stopped. For like the first week, starting on the 17th of March, we did curbside delivery still to clients um, with us picking out. And then we ended up stopping all that, um, but we raised funds to ship beds in a box to clients. So we shipped, so far we've shipped about 300 mattresses to families um, that we were just purchasing from stores and sending directly to clients um, with money from individual donors. So those are all, we offered that to everyone that had an appointment over the last, you know, six weeks. We said, hey, you're gonna have to wait till we reopen, but in the meantime, we'll at least ship you a bed. And so the thought is one, obviously helpful to have a bed, but two, that when we reopen, that'll help us a lot because we won't need to deal with the demand for beds because those folks already have beds. So that'll help us a little bit with our inventory as we reopen um, with donations being down. Um, so we are starting next week um, on May 4th we're gonna start doing curbside deliveries again and curbside donation pickups. So a lot of the same stuff as far as only picking up if the donations, you know, outside or in the garage, um, drivers wearing masks and gloves, and we're gonna have clients. Um, we are not, we talked about doing virtual. We're a little concerned about, um, I'm a little concerned, well, one with clients being able to handle it, but also the staff that I have that work in the warehouse are not exactly um, IT pros either. So I think the combination might be a bit disastrous. Um, so right now we're planning to have half hour phone calls um, while we tag items for the clients and just kind of explain to them what their options are. Like, hey, this is like this, you know, your color and preferences. So at least they feel like they're getting a little one-on-one -on -one attention, but maybe um, with a little less work on our end. Um, and in the beginning, we're just gonna do four families a day. We usually do 10, um, just because we're unsure about donations. And also because we typically have a veteran program um, that is a lot, like half of our staff are veterans in our um, employment program, and we're not starting that back up until June, um, just because a lot of those folks lit, already have compromised immune systems and are older and live in group environments. Um, so we make, we're making decisions not to start that until June, so that's going to limit our capacity a bit in May. 
There's a question I had for you, but I've lost it. Um, mm -hmm. Go ahead. Does this, I heard somebody else say something. Um, what kind of training are you doing with your staff? Are you doing something really formal or is it more informal? Yeah, have you guys even gotten there? Yeah, we have not gotten there. We're talking about it, so this is super helpful. Um, but what, what you said about following directions, I mean, I think that um, I have a wide range of folks, what they're doing in their personal lives as far as social distancing goes that works that work for us. And so I think that's just a little interesting as we go back. I think certain people have different ideas of what, what that means and how they're implementing it in their lives. Um, so I think the drivers would need some education on, on kind of how to, how to do that at work responsibly. So we'll see. Yeah. Have you guys, um, or anybody else, have you, Megan, talked with your team via Zoom about, with just with their team in general, about moving forward and what that looks like for them? Have they had much input into this? Or is it kind of coming more top down and this is how it's gonna go? Yeah, so the drivers have all been begging to go back. I think they're all bored. I mean, everyone's getting paid. Um, everyone is getting full pay um, during this time. So that's been great that we've been lucky enough to do that. Um, but folks are ready to come back. So no one seems to be complaining about that. My, I have concerns that I think the office staff can all still work from home. That's always one thing we always have concerns about is the divide that naturally happens between drivers and warehouse staff and office staff. And I don't, and so I have just some concerns to go back. Um, and so we're planning on having all the drivers come back on May 4th and the office staff, um, we have six in the office. We're gonna, two of us are gonna come in every day um, and alternate who you're paired up with uh, to do the client phone calls, even if that's not normally your job to be client service manager, just so I feel like it's a little more of an equal playing field and, and they don't feel like, you know, we're all just sitting at home and, and they're, they're driving. Yeah. That's interesting, right? The, the divide, we've thought about that too. It's gonna be even harder to, I don't know if other groups have that issue of, you know, office versus moving staff and the divide of, um, that naturally kind of tends to happen and that's gonna be so much harder to bring a team together when there's any issues when half of your team is digital and the other half is working in a potentially, you know, life-threatening environment um, to manage all those emotions and those challenges when you can't sit everybody down in the same room and just say, we're not leaving here until we get it figured out because we can't be in the same room. <laughs> um, so. We do, um, something we've, we're doing is we've got the virtual team is actually joining the, the morning huddles uh, by Zoom. So, and they, we go first, um, just to highlight that we are not sitting, kicking back, eating bonbons. Um, there's a lot, lots going on uh, virtually. Um, we find that helps and we do it daily. Um, so it's really, and then we've got a culture club that's doing back channel updates with them just to see if what they're saying to us as management uh, reconciles with what they're thinking with one another. What's a culture club? Oh, uh, <laughs> Our, our staff uh, who organize the, the picnics and the, the various other team building events. Thank you for sharing a little bit of that, Megan. Does anyone have any questions for Megan? I have just in general, it's not for Megan in particular. Yeah, but, um, so ours, it sounds like our program is much smaller than a lot of people's. Um, I'm the only staff member on our furniture program. Everyone else is volunteers. Um, it's a program under the umbrella of a nonprofit that works to end homelessness. Um, and so I, I guess I would be curious to hear if there's any other programs out there that it's only volunteers that would be moving the furniture and maybe any protocols that they're putting into place around that. Yeah. Hi, this is uh, Jeff and Sue from uh, First Start Furniture Bank. And we're uh, in Middlesex County in Massachusetts, which is an absolute bullseye for the coronavirus. I think we have 13,000 cases in our county. Mm -hmm. So, and almost all of our volunteers are, sick, you know, retired, 65 and up, et cetera. High risk. So we're very and high we, risk. And we lost a volunteer unrelated to, you know, we don't have a clue after we closed down, weeks after we closed down, we've had a volunteer pass away. So if you think it's not going to hit your house, be prepared. It it's yeah. a good chance it will, and it's hard. We are a very small knit group. We have 25 to 30 volunteers per shift. We do 12 clients um, a, a shift, and we're only open two hours on 
uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays and three hours on Saturdays. So we're really pretty efficient. But, you know, Jeff and I are volunteers. Um, our truck drivers are all volunteers. We have one part-time um, store manager. So we're, pro we're in the same boat as you, you know. Yeah. So, what, so what we have done is we have emailed all of our agencies to let them know that we will be open for emergency cases. These are basically home, people coming out of homeless shelters or whatever. Um, and we pointed them at a, a Google questionnaire where they go through and they fill out all the information about the client, the client's needs, et cetera. Um, and then we review that and if that client fits the our profile, we'll uh, call the agency, discuss with them the, uh, the need for the client, then we'll call the clients and discuss their needs. Um, and we've done uh, video chats. And we'll, do, we'll do video chats if, if they can, point them the various pieces of furniture. So we'll have a very small team in the store picking the furniture out for them while they're talking to the clients. Uh, then we have a separate team come in on another day and move the furniture um, out to where the, cl the, the clients have to bring in a truck. We don't, move, we don't deliver furniture. So the clients bring a, a U-Haul, we bring the furniture out, place it by their, their, their truck, and once we place all the furniture, we let the clients pack their trucks. So there's no interaction between the client and any of our staff. And most of them are bringing in uh, moving companies. Most of the agencies right now seem to be hiring. Um, the veterans groups are, a lot of the shelters, because they're letting these people out with no furniture, they seem to be hiring. Um, but we do have a woman Tuesday coming in who is bringing a box truck. But so far, it's that they have to stay in their truck until we uh, are away from the premise. We're lucky we have a really, 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 really big parking lot okay. area where our loading trucks are. And um, it's pretty quiet all the time. We're very lucky in that respect. So we can do the social distancing. But we have gloves. We have masks. We have... We have a person who's kind of watching over everything to make sure that everyone stays apart but not getting too close together. And they're not actually involved with uh, the moving process. They're just kind of a watcher and keeping people apart. But the hard thing is, and I'm sure other people have found it, is you can't get cleaning supplies. You cannot find Lysol. You cannot find things that you need to practice. I mean, we all have some supply, but it's going to run out. And I'm not sure when we're going to see that again. And, you know, that is a big question for us is when we run out of these items, where do you, how do you go next? We're all hopeful they're coming in, but how do we handle that? Because we have to keep everybody safe. And we even have donors who are making masks to hand out. We're doing kits for clients. So a client will get a little care package with masks for them, for their children. Because Massachusetts is, it's, you know, for you folks in New York, too, I mean, in Chicago, we're really hard hit. It's tough. Yeah. Yeah, we're in, we're in Hartford, and um, it's, like, it's coming up to Hartford. Like, Hartford's becoming the new spot in Connecticut, um, and then it's you know, obviously going up to Mass and so forth. Um, so we're definitely seeing a lot of changes, and, and since our focus is those experiencing homelessness, it's um, a very vulnerable vulnerable population to start with. So we're trying to figure out how we can make those um, precautions and those rules around keeping everyone safe and distant and all that. So, but thank you for letting me know. No, it is hard because um, I grew up in Connecticut. I grew up very close to Hartford. So, and I have family in Connecticut and, you know, afterwards we're welcome to talk to you and, you know, we come home, you know, do help exchange information because sure. it's tough. And as far as donations are concerned, we have, we're allowing moving companies to come in, like 1-800-GOT-JUNK, uh, companies like that, and they're responsible for offloading their trucks right into a storage area where so we quarantine the furniture for you know, 72 plus hours before we ever go anywhere near it. So at that point, uh, it could be... Uh, um, We're actually quarantined for about a week right now before we touch it, and we feel that, you know, we knew our store was safe because we were closed down six weeks. Um, so everything in the store was safe, but we're, we're trying to quarantine things in storage. So we're, we're not accepting any donations from the general public other than if you have a moving company come in and they will deliver it directly to us and then we, as we said, quarantine things. But we don't let any uh, the general public come and drop off anything or anything like that right now. No. Is it being quarantined in like pod or? Sorry. We have a big, uh, you know, Warehouse five, 6,000 square foot uh, warehouse area, and one section is just set aside 
for quarantine furniture. And then once it comes out of quarantine, then we move it into the, the dresser, the sofa, aisles, et cetera. And we know that it's it's safe to, to pick from. It all gets dated when it comes in so we can visually see without touching it when it came in so we can make the, um, you know, the visual look to see. Because we find if it's not visual, easy visual to read, people aren't gonna take time. Right. So I have a question for everybody that has been um, working with clients in some sort of virtual capacity. Um, in Portland, we work with a lot of immigrants who have very poor English language skills. And, um, you know, we're lucky if we can connect with them on cell phones using Google Translate. So I'm curious how you uh, jump that hurdle. A great question, Jen. <laughs> okay, so Fresh Start Furniture Bank, we're very lucky in our store manager speaks fluent Spanish. And we also have volunteers who speak fluent Spanish and Portuguese. And we get them to help us out with calling the client and talking to them. And all our documents are in Spanish, Portuguese, English, and different versions of Spanish. If you're from Puerto Rico versus Mexico versus El Salvador, you know, they're all a little different. So we've really been working on being trilingual. Um, we make it the social worker's responsibility to do that. So we have every social worker submits a checklist to us of everything that their client is going to need. And then we work off of that. We do ask social workers during normal times if their client can't speak English that they accompany them. But we have we have just in emergency mode right now. So we have asked the social worker to communicate with them. The only thing that I ask in return is I want a picture of the truck that they're coming in before they actually come so that the way we're doing it right now is just emergencies. I have one coming tomorrow um, and we, put everything outside that the client is going to need and then we go back inside and they pull up with the truck and they load everything into the truck. We just want to make sure that the truck is actually coming so that we don't have to load everything back inside again. So that's the only reason why we, normally we don't need a picture, but in this particular case, if we're going to put a whole apartment's worth of stuff outside, we just want to make sure the truck is actually coming. And Nancy, how do you can decide what is an emergency? Because I know our our agencies would say they're all emergencies because they're all kind of in the same boat. Right. So right now we're doing um, domestic violence uh, that needs someplace to go really quickly. Um, if they were homeless and they're being moved into a, a, an apartment and finding home. The one tomorrow is um, a mom who was COVID positive and her kids were uh, put in foster care. And in order to give her kids back, to get her kids back, she needs to have beds and appropriate. So, you know, we're, we're sort of doing it case by case. Last week, it was a, um, a veteran. We're just asking the social workers really to use their judgment. And they've been really good and respectful about it. They, they sort of know who can wait and, and who can't. Um. I want to acknowledge that we've been on an hour. Um, I know I'm not much good after an hour and a half um, personally, but I, I do feel there's probably some other knowledge out there. Um, does anyone have any big questions that have been looming on their mind that haven't been talked about yet? Hello, um, if I may, uh, can you hear me? I can. Okay, great. Uh, my name's Nelson. I'm with uh, Liz and Brian from Homeless and Travelers Aid Society in Albany, in Albany, New York. Pardon me if we've partially covered this before, um, but one question I do have is a logistical concern. Um, I know, for example, my uh, wife is from Ohio, pretty flat, we live in just single family. Um, a place like Albany or more urban areas tend to have high-rise apartments um, and a lot of our clients tend to be older 
Um, so logistically, and this came up during the morning meeting we had, um, are there any suggestions or advice for serving more infirmed clients in uh, living arrangements that are difficult to access, such as, you know, you get up the stairs to a third flight without an elevator or um, up to the 21st floor of a high rise with, you know, minimal interaction. I'm just wondering if an experience other banks share, and if so, how is that dealt with? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, we haven't started uh, started our furniture program, but our plan right now is to do a lot of drop offs or pickups. So um, people will just drop things off at the apartments, like somebody had described earlier, and then the clients their clients' responsibility to get it up to whatever fur or wherever they're at. Um, normally, um, before this started, we would go in and hike everything up three or four flights of stairs, and it, you know, and struggle the way up um, if the client helped or not. It's a different story. Um, right now, our plan, once we restart, is to drop things off and have them, you know, find friends or neighbors or whomever um, that's going to help them um, or have them pick up right from our, our warehouse so there's less interaction with um, multiple floors and multiple people and, and small elevators and, and the like. So. Is, is anybody doing in-home delivery right now? No. So we are um, Chicago Furniture Bank. So um, prior to the COVID-19 outbreak, um, we still did not offer delivery anything above the second floor. So any third, fourth, five-story walk-ups without an elevator, we would not do. Mm -hmm. And what we have seen is a number one of our partner agencies, primarily those serving, um, you know, victims of domestic violence, single mothers, and things people who may have lost that support network who don't have the means to, to get, you know, family to, to move them in. Um, what I am seeing is they are either one of two things. One, um, they're working with us strictly just prov to provide beds for them. So they will have their property managers or whatnot come to the warehouse to pick up beds for the family and then earmarking a, a, a virtual appointment down the line for whenever we can Either they find out movers or us be able to, to re-offer, to offer in-home installation again. That's one thing. Second, um, local moving companies, um, you know, business is down for them. Obviously, I'm seeing more, I'm hearing more and more through our partner agencies that they're, you know, getting better deals. So they, instead of installation or deliveries, they are switching to self-haul. So they're paying, you know, our $50 appointment fee. And then their movers who are providing the in-home installation are coming and receiving the furniture. And then lastly, um, it's kind of a, a to be determined, but in the past week we've received a number of, of requests to provide in-home installation if, you know, prior to um, placement. So there's a big push for the city, like everywhere. For the city to get people from shelter to declutter shelters and get these people into the units. Um, they're immediately phase one placed into hotels for a week. And then phase two is to move them into uh, a three to four more long term transitional unit or property. And they're trying to work with us to put together cautions to potentially be able to provide in home installation to vacant units prior yeah. to prior to them switching from uh, from that hotel from the you know city of Chicago hotel to it so I will obviously be giving updates as it goes on we're still trying to work on you know if that's a thing um, just going back and forth with them yeah that's an interesting thought to do that before they even get there yeah um, we in St. Louis have not opened yet, but we're starting the conversation about what that looks like. Um, and and we may not end up doing in-home deliveries, but um, I, I think that that's such an important part of what we do, especially with the clients that we work with in St. Louis that wouldn't necessarily have the capacity to move furniture in um, without somebody to do it for them, right? Um, because they just don't have the health capacity or it's a single mom of three. Um, 
And so what we've been looking at is, of course, you know, asking very certain COVID related questions about if they've been sick in the last week or whatever, um, some kind of questionnaire for the, the clients before we agree to bring their furniture. Um, but also if trying to find some kind of an outfit and maybe um, we go and do one delivery and come back and then the movers are required to completely change clothes um, before they go do another one. Um, so it might limit the number of people that we serve um, at first, but then some kind of like changing of all of the clothes to kind of scrubbing and washing hands and all that jazz. Um, but we're, we haven't really considered not taking the furniture in the homes because we don't feel like our clients would be able to do it without us. Um, although that is an interesting thing to pose back to those case managers too, because I think the case managers are so uh, excited to get their clients furniture that this might be an additional opportunity to be like, okay, what solutions can we come up with together um, that typically they wouldn't worry about messing with the furniture, but now we might need to enlist the resources. Um, we haven't figured it out yet, but I can definitely keep you updated on what kind of policies or procedures we end up using. Thank you. Yeah. Any other thoughts about in-home delivery? Any other questions in general? Melissa, do you have any questions? So Melissa's our person that coordinates our incoming donations. One question we got the other day um, was that somebody specifically had passed away from COVID and their family wanted to donate their stuff. Um, so that was an interesting one. Melissa, do you have any thoughts or questions? Um, well, some of my questions were, were in regards, well, First of all, I think it's going to be very difficult for us to say no to our individual donors. And I'm curious how people are handling the people who just show up to drop things off. Because I sense that as soon as um, the community sees activity at Home Sweet Home, those drop offs are going to start. And um, we already have to battle with people dropping things off after hours that are unusable. Um, so, so I'm concerned about messaging that says we are not taking donations from individual donors until we're ready to. And then I'm also um, curious about the people that are taking like liquidations or large scale donations. Um, if you're taking everything or if you have some leeway to say what you can't use because we have, have struggled with getting large quantities of things um and maybe a third of it we can't use and then we end up being you know needing to move it or dispose of it and the cost of disposing um in terms of manpower and and, and disposal fees is is a big dent um on us so those are my questions for people Does it get bulk furniture? Do you do you say no to stuff? Oh, um, if I may, uh, we have similar issues at the Capital Region Furniture Bank in Albany. Um, we do have a list of goods we generally accept and don't accept, and we screen those over phone call um, prior to pickup. Um, I think there's a couple of days of deal junk. You know things you you don't necessarily need but aren't junk um i know a few companies work around that habitat i think will come to your home to pick what they need and then just leave what they don't need um we do have a uh, 50 dollars charge pickup furniture their service is going out there using our fuel um wear and tear on the truck and the drivers uh, so that's kind of how we manage that um you know, we still get the issue of, oh, I have this nice armoire, but our clients live on the fifth floor with no elevator, so there's a bit of negotiating back and forth there. And the costs do up, as you said, for the dump and things like that. Um, I don't know. Maybe some of that is 
um, education and driver training on how to conflict mediate and say people deliver things to you that you can't handle. Um, otherwise, I, I can't think of a hard and fast solution for that problem. Melissa, I'm Duneshka with Community Warehouse in Oregon, Portland, Oregon. We are saying no to everything right now, period. We don't have the bandwidth emotionally or physically to um, go through the process that each bulk donation requires, especially when it comes from a hotel. Uh, in the good times, which is like when everything is normal and we have all the bandwidth in the world, it's still a pain on the butt to like make it w work. Like the timing of the hotel, letting us uh, uh, um, inspect every mattress individually, avoid cross contamination, all of it in the best scenario is a pain. So right now we're like, no, thank you. Um, and then Andrew from the Chicago Furniture Bank. So uh, in terms of these bulk donations, um, unless we are doing, unless we submitted a bid and are, and are doing the liquidation ourselves, uh, we are turning around those items. Uh, what we're kind of seeing is we're coming into any type of liquidation of, of a hotel. Um, they're getting a the write off. It's just as much as we can take. Uh, we ask for photos for everything that they are submitting. Uh, more times than not, um, you know, the, the 300 pound hotel um, entertainment system that can't be used as a dresser, we will not take. So things with granite and stuff like that, we can't physically move it. We're not, we're not going to take it. Um, we are fortunate that we are in the industrial strike sh sh sector, <laughs> sorry, uh, of Chicago, which means that, you know, a lot of the liquidators that we are working with have, have showrooms and have things current like here within a, a four mile radius of us. So we're able to literally drive down there and do the, uh, my partner Griff and I will we'll pick it up. And if, if we can't, we're not taking it type thing. Well, good. So Dineshka, let me ask. So if you're not taking things, how do you deal with incoming inventory um, to provide what you need to deliver right now or to move your mission? So we close on March 16 and we reopen two weeks later to provide only home to go kits with which they are brand new items. Uh, the kit is a small dresser that most of them have been uh, uh, donated by a, by a local manufacturer and then oh, and you guys put this stuff in the dresser, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what I do want to tell to the group is that is important is that we have fundraised more money than ever in the same amount of, in a short amount of time, because people love the home to go kids idea. It's the first time that the county actually provide any funding to community warehouse. And it was about hundred thousand dollars for staff and to buy items for the home to go kids. Uh, we got, we put a couple of uh, matching gifts of different donors just to make about $15,000 match. And since then we have received over $30,000 just for the kids, uh, including the match. So um, it's an opportunity to, to, it's been a phenomenal opportunity to get new friends for Community Warehouse that hopefully are long-term friends um, because people love to buy these little new things. Um, so to answer the question, uh, we are only providing the home to go kids at this time. I think this week um, we are starting to let some case managers uh, select from the supply that we have right now because clearly it's been there for more than three days. It's been there for more than six weeks. <laughs> And about next week or two weeks from now, I don't know if, if Joe can come in, I don't know exactly what the date is, we will start receiving donations at a, at a small quantity. Maybe we are going to limit it just to kitchen items or we're going to only limit it to like a portion of the home to make the message clear. And then it will be isolated for three days before redistribution.
Gotcha. Thanks. Um, Danesca also brought up a, a really good question um, that I actually saw echoed on a blog um, by Joan Gary uh, a few weeks ago. You saw, okay. Um, so, and, and kind of um, the folks at, at, I think, is it New Life, um, maybe there in Boston, have already experienced. Um, what do you do or are you already prepared for if one of your staff or volunteers uh, is infected with COVID? Do you already have a communication ready for that? What does that look like? And um, how many of you are prepared to challenge that communication and life issue? Jeff, do you, have you guys, like, you guys have done a great job on social media sharing some information um, about, about your volunteer. Um. Well, we, we shared our information as soon as we found out. Um, our, our volunteers, we have over 100 active volunteers. We're, we're a small family. Everybody wanted to know. We, we emailed everybody. We have a volunteer Facebook page so people can communicate. Um, Kate and I are trying to reach out to so many volunteers every day just to make them still feel part of the community. I'm sure many of you are like we are in that many of your volunteers are home alone. Mm -hmm. That's really hard. Um, you know, there's no one else in the house. Um, you know, we're, we have not discussed our plans for bringing our, all our volunteers back. We're working with a group of five right now and that's it because it hit us too close to home. So we, we, don't, we don't know what that is yet. And we have so many cases in our county, I mean, it's just ridiculous how many we have. I mean, right now we're in Mexico, and my county has basically the same number of cases as all Mexico has. So it's, it's, a, it's a really hard hit area. So we just don't know what's gonna happen and when we're gonna be able to back up. And, you know, we don't have a huge, you know, a lot of you furniture banks, we, we don't have a big group of paid staff who want to work and are coming in and doing the things, you know, it's, it's a group of us volunteers and, you know, thank goodness for our store manager, you know, but we're figuring it out like you all are. We don't know what that is yet. So we're not actually letting volunteers uh, interact with one another. The, we're starting a system of scheduling that they'll schedule an hour or two uh, and then so they won't overlap. So like a, a volunteer unit, like a family, will go in and volunteer uh, and do what they need to be done. They'll leave, there'll be a, a gap between the next volunteer group. And so it's very unlikely the contra contraction of uh, COVID. Uh, so we don't suspect that it'll, I mean, I, we just don't see it happening. It won't be from New Life or volunteering at New Life uh, because of the fact that we don't let people interact with one another. Um, are, as I say, Rich, are you worried though about the people who come in that they, you know, there there could be, you know, the virus is active and it could be in the store and you've got this time in between, you know? It, it, it's going to be every, like, if you read the stuff coming out of the homeless shelters in Boston, the 14%, they did uh, tested Pine Street in the 14% of, uh -huh. of the homeless population there had some, had uh, COVID, an active case and were asymptomatic. I think it's uh, it's very hard to. That's why we're moving to a, a, an idea of uh, sort of like isolating groups. Uh, like you can say it, it gets onto furniture and that, uh, and can be spread like that. But the the risk of it happening is very low. Um, and then again, we provide cleaning supplies. Like you're gonna the gloves, the the masks, everything to make people uh, safer. But it, it's hard to, to it, we're concerned. I, I think everybody's concerned, but we're just trying to take, uh, I guess, sensible safety precautions to make it from, from, from spreading. I think that the biggest spread is interaction between people and the spread of through uh, coughing, sneezing, et cetera, then the transmission through, uh, you know, furniture. But again, just like everybody else, we're going to be disinfecting everything you touch, disinfecting hands, et cetera. So the, the, I, I feel like the, the risk is very minimal. How are you disinfecting your furniture? 
so we don't we uh, so all of the furniture we currently have is not uh, was donated prior to the, the the close so we're not overly concerned and then the Wayfair stuff all came from from Tennessee and travel and took uh, I don't know nearly three four days and now it's sat another three or four days in the warehouse without people touching it so again I think that just the the quarantining is is a big step in that uh we don't plan to take furniture now i don't think uh because of the fact that wayfair has been so generous you know i just asked because you're a fellow massachusetts furniture bank and getting cleaning products in our sector of the oh. country is so difficult that i was just curious what other massachusetts or connecticut banks are how, where are they procuring anything so, i have a uh, video that i'm going to share on the, the roundtable website um, which is from a Massachusetts, New Hampshire coalition of people who run recycling centers, uh, refuse, etc. And basically what comes out of this is that you really don't have to worry all that much about the furniture. It's the person-to-person -person contact. Um, because they, they sit there and they run through all these, they uh, had an epidemiologist on here. It's a really long video, let's skip the first 10, 12 minutes. But they basically say, don't worry about physical contact with furniture. And I'll let you guys all view this and draw your own conclusions. But that's what I came away with uh, from watching this, this video. So um, we've just started doing the isolated groups at New Life. So it's still something we're figuring out also. Um, and also just as a disclaimer, I only started at New Life three weeks ago while we've been closed. So um, a question I have for everybody is how are people staying engaged with volunteers? Because not only do I not know many of the volunteers yet, but um, I've had a lot of emails asking to get involved and we have introduced this isolated group idea, but in general, how do you keep that relationship while also maintaining their safety? Susan, you have thoughts? We we are still having our monthly meetings, our monthly volunteer meetings via Zoom. Okay. And we're also, so regarding paid employees, it's just myself as outreach operations manager and my boss, the community outreach pastor, Ashley. And Ashley and I are calling all of our volunteers partly to keep the relationship feeling alive and also to make sure that everyone's okay and and ask if they need anything from us but you know we chat for a while and we find that that's keeping the connection nourished um, a couple things that we have um, done and, and I don't want to take up anybody's time who's already involved, but at the end of when we're done, I'd be happy to talk about this for anybody who doesn't. Um, if you're not familiar with Giving Tuesday, they're doing a Giving Tuesday now, May 5th, and you'd still have time to get registered on their website. A lot of local, there's a lot of local organizations too, so I'd look for what's local. And for us, it was is Giving Tuesday, but we have Give Big Pittsburgh. So there's a fundraiser that you could pull your volunteers in and try to kind of get involved through social media to do a little bit of fundraising now because they're doing it as uh, our local is COVID response 19. So it's give big Pittsburgh COVID response or COVID 19 response. Um, and another thing that we recently did was we sent out a Google form survey that said, um, how, you know, what is your greatest fear right now? What are you doing to, um, you know, or what can we do? What would, how would you be comfortable coming back? What are the things that you would need to be able to, to come back and volunteer? You know, are you willing to wear gloves and masks? But basically it was reaching out to them to see where they are, what their fears are, and to let them know that we value their input as far as coming back. Um, if and when we are able to do that. Um, and we got, we got a pretty good response from um, whether it was no fears, no problems. And we also asked them, you know, is there anything that we can do for you at this time? Um, and we sent that out to over 600 um, people on, on our volunteer list. So 
um, those are two of the things that we're doing. We're just getting ready to send some stuff out to us people to help with this Giving Tuesday now. Something I just, suggestion, are you? I, just put a, I just put a file in the chat. It's just something I saw just yesterday. So we we more or less mobilized because we're our volunteers aren't active right now. So we've given them something that they can do from home safely. And in our case, it's pick up the phone and using the call script that's there, reach out to the donors over the last two years. And it's simple. It's not a, a fundraising thing, but it's re-engaging and connecting. Um, and we're already seeing a subset are uh, getting involved in some of the other activities that we're currently doing. So, uh, so our volunteers are, they all want to come back, but they also know that it could be a long time before they can come back in a, in a normal way. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, another question that was posted, and maybe we'll we'll wrap this up. But if you, with this last question, but if you have other questions, drop them in the box, um, and we can always um, have a next round some other time. Um, was let me see if I can find out, how is everyone doing communication with their board? Um, on what level is their board helping and how are you helping the board to feel calm and focused? Great questions. And some of you are board members as opposed to, well, probably if you're on this call and you're a board member, you're probably very, very active, so. So I, I know from Home Sweet Home's perspective, um, we have, our board has been overwhelmingly amazing. Um, really stepped up um, in, in new and amazing ways. So we were lucky to have a reserve fund and they have been able to identify um, some best worst case scenarios with that to see how long that can, can last us and they're um, also, working with the staff to kind of come up with a task force on what reopening looks like. Um, they've been great at saying, okay, you guys get the operational pieces of opening. Um, we want to help figure out how to poke holes in it and how to um, mitigate any liability and figure out how we can support the mission. Um, but I, which we were doing anyway, I have weekly phone calls with my board president and the treasurer and they only last about 10, 15 minutes. Um, but that has just helped continue those check-ins of, even if it's just, how are you doing, as opposed to, this is what we have to focus on um, financially right now. Um, and the, the only struggle I've had in St. Louis is, I honestly, I, I can't keep up with their willingness to be engaged. Um, and so trying to find ways to really do my job, sorry, that beeping is a kid's watch, I think, um, find a way to balance doing my job, but also feed all 18 board members things that they can actively be doing is my biggest challenge. Um, and I 18? keep them updated as needed or at least once a week. Did you say 18, Betsy? Yes. <laughs> you are a saint. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> I am only have five. I have a daily uh, check-in with my chairman and just a weekly summary of what's going on. So yeah, a supportive board makes all the difference in the world, but they are definitely living by the uh, uh, eyes in, fingers out model of, of governance right now while we deal with this. Any other board perspectives? It also a good, our board are all very active in day-to-day -day operations. We're all on committees that are active with stuff. So we're all very engaged with the whole, everything that's going on. Our last board meeting was entirely dedicated to discussing this, the COVID and how we're going to do things and go forward with it. Good. Um, yeah, again, uh, our board was, uh, in terms of the, the, pay, the paycheck protection programs, our board was very active on that, as well as sending weekly uh, updates and follow-ups pertaining, you know, PPE procurements, um, and yeah, just updates. Andrew, that brings up a great question. Who here applied for uh, PPP funding? And who here received it? Nothing. Okay, yeah. well, there were some yep. that did. Okay, yep. well, that's promising. Good for you all. <laughs> I'm happy for you all. Um, 
it's been an hour and a half. Uh, there's some other questions and I wrote down some things for next topics like fundraising. Probably we could go further into board stuff. Somebody asked about volunteer software. Um, where did that one go? Who had that question? It was uh, me. I, okay, Maggie, you want to go ahead and ask it? Yeah, so we're trying to figure out because, you know, we've kind of just been open to volunteers whenever the warehouse is open. We're very small furniture bank also. Um, we are only open to referrals from uh, social service agencies that house homeless individuals. So we're open um, Mondays and Saturdays, but we're just kind of open for whoever wants to come in and help out. So we're trying to decide how many people at a time can come in um, on those days and you know, how do we schedule them? So I'm trying to figure out if, if there is a software system that people have been happy with that they're using, if it's free because, you know, as everyone else has noticed, their funds have been dropping significantly. And, you know, we're, we're at the point now where I may not have a job um, because our funds have dropped so much, which is a little unnerving. Um, and I am the only employee, everyone else is volunteers. So, it's a little nerving um, on that aspect. So anything that is very little funds coming out of our pocket to use, um, everything we do is on Google Docs, um, but I'd prefer not to use that if I can avoid it. Um, but if anybody has a system that they use that they really like. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm the only staff person on ours as well. Um, we're in Hartford, Connecticut, and we use signups.com um, for, folks to sign up you can set the number of um, slots that are available for folks on all these okay. different days you can schedule it out you know for every Monday um, you know for every first Monday of the month etc um, I believe we originally had the free platform which worked just fine um, we upgraded to a paid one which I don't think was very much um, we're a nonprofit so we try to keep our costs low and that was only because it helped us add a waiver to the sign up um, system so okay. that we didn't have to have a paper waiver as well as this online platform. And that's okay. been really cool. Thank we've you. been, one way we've actually been engaging volunteers is to have test out one of these systems and it's called Band, it's an app. Um, I'm not incredibly fond of it, but um, the volunteers that are testing it are. Um, does anyone use that? Probably for good reason. <laughs> <laughs> um, that would be an interesting thing that we could post on um, Facebook later, is just kind of what other apps people use to manage their volunteers. So I'll, I'll write that down, Maggie. Awesome, um, thanks. Yeah, everybody, okay, we'll wrap up. Um, I will hopefully be able to post, oh, damn buzzer, um, post the link to this on Facebook later. Um, if anyone hasn't told you, or your board hasn't told you, or your boss hasn't told you, you are doing an amazing job. These are wild, unprecedented times, and uh, nonprofits tend to make the best out of really crappy situations with very limited resources. And um, I, I heard a few things that just, you know, made me laugh, and I could see other people laughing and nodding their heads. Like somebody said, in the best of times, this furniture bank business can be a really wild and crazy adventure. Um, and so you all are doing amazing. So just remember that. And I think it will be incredibly hard as we all figure out how to move forward. Um, things will change on a daily basis and we have to manage our households and our work and our employees and each other. So um, just good job and keep up the great work. Thanks for organizing, Betsy. Thank you, Betsy. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank Very you. good seeing everybody. Thank Bye. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.